This here is a standard diagram of what you might call a dialectic. It's a scary word, I know, but don't worry, it's fairly simple. One thing affects another thing, and this combines to form a synthesis. You can apply this to just about everything. Heat meets water equals hot water. Weird social groups meet the internet equals 4chan. Sean plus Jan equals wholesome Twitch streams. But viewing it purely like this can limit the way we perceive these actions. Let's call it by its true essence. A contradiction. Before we talk about contradiction, I think it's first best that we talk about something else, just so that we're all on the same page. Materialism. Essentially, it posits that all manner of things in life are determined first and foremost by the material conditions and not by intention or value. If René Descartes, for example, were to say, I think, therefore I am, the materialist would say, I am, therefore I think. This fulfills a fundamental basis within Marxism and determines in many ways how we view all manner of things in life. From nature to culture, from the past to progress, from the evolution and dissolution of empires, and even the evolution of online streaming apps. They're all determined by their material realities first and foremost, not what we think of them. A furious critique leveled by all manner of people from Jordan Peterson to Benito Mussolini is that materialism is far too fatalistic, and it ignores various other aspects of life in favour of viewing humanity going down a narrow path of economically predetermined history. But this isn't true. Whilst determinism does play a role, we don't ignore the fact that all manner of mutation does exist in life but simply that there are laws that do determine our reality from which, if they didn't exist, nothing else would exist either. Marx summarized this perfectly. We make history, but not as we choose. We do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but from circumstances already existing, given, and transmitted from the past. Or, as my girlfriend put it, Smiths wouldn't be a thing if it was all fine dandy, would it? Now that we're cleared up... Everything hitherto is the story of contradiction. The essence of what a dialectic is. Contradictions are a fact of life itself. No one thing can exist without the other. In maths, you have your pluses and your minuses. In physics, you have action and reaction. Advance and retreat, past and future, night and day, finite and infinite, no one thing exists in isolation from the other. Now this can help us explain a lot about life, but it does have its limits. For example, why is this the particular reaction to this and that? Well, the answer to that lies within said things themselves. All of these things have their own internal contradictions. With any concept, with any thing in life, the cause of development lies within said thing itself. Everything from without is thereby an external contradiction. Want to see an example? This is Fred. Fred is, on the surface at least, a product of his own external contradictions. But it all begins with this. If I plant the seed in the soil, give it plenty of sunlight and water, Fred is the end result of what you'll get. If, however, I didn't use a seed, but rather a stone, even if I used all of the same things, you will only ever get a soggy stone. The point here is not that external causes are meaningless, but rather that internal causes are the basis of change, and external causes are only ever activated through the orientation of the internal one. If I smash this glass against the desk, it will shatter into a million pieces. But if I were to do the same with a much tougher object, then the object would remain firm. Internal, external. Or, internal, external. Take your pick. And of course, when you pile all these contradictions up, you not only simply get contradictions of an individual basis, but of a societal one. Now we're getting somewhere. In our economy, employers must inherently cut wages and lay off workers to survive competition. This activates external issues. 
People cannot buy stuff if they have no money. People cannot sell stuff if they have no buyers. Internal, external. This is also, of course, the failure of fascism. Problems are never external alone. They all originate from the internal source. So that's internal and external, but what else of contradictions? Well, they're also benign and antagonistic. Take a road. Yes, roads. Roads, roads, roads. If you've ever cycled on a British road, you can totally understand how brazen the contradiction between four wheels and two wheels is. This can be very hostile towards two wheelers, or in my case, one wheelers, but there's no need to go around destroying all car owners to get around this. They can be solved through non antagonistic methods. This is only because both parties' goals are mutually inclusive. It just so happens that our ways of going about it aren't in sync at the moment with the current apparatus. Owners want the most out of their workforce as possible through paying them the least. But I, being the greedy worker that I am, want the opposite. The most amount of pay with the least amount of work. Our interests then are therefore antagonistic and cannot be solved in the same way as benign contradictions. The very structure of this contradiction creates the basis of two classes, and thereby class struggle. It's therefore only possible that this class struggle is solved through direct, objective aggression, and not collaboration or compromise. So that's the theory, but how might we apply this to our everyday practice? Maoist lifestyleism, if you want. <laughs> Well, first of all, analyzing life as but a series of contradictions helps us to micromanage our trials and tribulations. If you cut off the source, you end all the problems. That is in contrast to taking an arbitrary formula as a fix-all solution to everything and applying it everywhere. Life adapts, new contradictions emerge. We must be ready to throw away our dogmatism and accept the new challenges that await us. Let me give you an example. We all know by now that the solution to capitalism is solved through socialism. But what about something else that's spoken about quite a lot on political discourse, say, imperialism? Well, with imperialism, you can't just throw socialism at it and expect it to all be solved. No, with this, it requires its own particular solution, anti-imperialism. Now, a lot of people get quite wary about the concept of anti-imperialism. Some people don't think it has any merit. But think of it like this. What would we say to something like patriarchy or toxic masculinity? Most of us so-called degenerates don't simply believe that socialism will be the fix-all solution to this, do we? No. Instead, we assert that this contradiction is solved through feminism. Likewise, racism is not solved through race blindness, but rather through solidarity. We said we're not going to fight capitalism with black capitalism, but we're going to fight it with socialism. We still have said we're not going to fight reactionary pigs and reactionary state attorneys like this and reactionary state attorneys like Hanrahan with any other reactions on our part. We're going to fight their reactions with all of those people to get together and have an international full-time revolution. Right on. That is Black Panther Fred Hampton. And whilst you might have already heard of this speech, you may not have realised that what he is in actual fact displaying here are the particularities of contradiction. Racism is not solved through more racism, but through solidarity between one another. Bigotry and reaction is not solved through more reaction, but through social and cultural transformation. Capitalism is not solved through race-specific capitalism, but through socialism. Like I said, internal and external, and they need to be treated with such application. What else? Well, separating contradictions between benign and antagonistic can help us better figure out which route we should take. Should we engage in direct action in this circumstance, or can it be solved through less aggressive methods? Mistaking a benign contradiction for an antagonistic one can set us back a long way, and it can transform something that could previously have just been solved through a simple discussion into something that can now only be solved through hammers and sickles. Or bricks and pitchforks, take your pick, I don't care. An overlying discourse on the left is, discussion never solves anything against our opponents. And yes, that is true in certain circumstances, I will admit, 
But you don't need to keep repeating this in every single scenario. In many instances, disagreements can be overcome through civil discourse and tactical unity. And it's not good to neglect this and fall into the trap of ultra-leftism. But contradictions never really solved. Because whenever that dialectic forms, it sets into motion a new one to take its place, made up of all of the bits and pieces that came before it, and before that, and before that, and after that, and after that, and so on. If you've ever moved to a new place, you might find this cycle of change chart quite relatable. Initially, you may have been really excited when you move in. You have an uninformed optimism about the time ahead. However, this naivete creates conditions for distress. You realise that it's not as easy as you once thought it was. As you begin to adjust to your new surroundings, things begin to get better. But, just as you thought they were going smoothly now, they suddenly drop once again. But now, you're better informed. It unlocks new scenarios that never first occurred to you, but this time, you're not as distressed. You've learned from your experiences, and you utilise them to overcome. This path continues on and on until you've come to some degree of equilibrium. Now that I think about it, this could just about relate to pretty much anything. And what they are, are contradictions. Unlocked and continuing infinitely as the past affects the present and creates the future. There sure are a lot of contradictions in the world, but not all contradictions are created equal. There are hierarchies involved. Sometimes they will intensify, sometimes they will pacify, but not be solved entirely. We can therefore separate this into primary and secondary contradictions. At one point in history, the main contradiction was that of between the aristocrats and the third estate, made up of the peasants, capitalists, and workers. But as that contradiction was solved, another took its place. Now that of between the worker and the capitalist. What happened to the peasantry? Benign contradiction, solved through industrialization. Now to say that there is a hierarchy involved is not dismiss secondary contradictions, but simply that by viewing all contradictions through the lens of a primary one can help us better ascertain the terrain that we're dealing with. That contradiction between the capitalists and the workers was always there, but because of the nature of the ruling class at the time and the nature of the economy, feudalism, it did not concern the masses that much. It had not intensified. Times change. So do contradictions. The most clear example of this that I can think of happened during the Chinese Civil War. At first, the Red Army took upon the primary contradiction between that of the revolutionaries and the reactionaries. However, then something happened. Japan invaded. Suddenly, this contradiction had to take a backseat to fill in the new contradiction that had emerged, that had intensified. Now the first, the primary contradiction, was that of between the nation and the imperialists. Taking all of this into consideration is what led the Red Army to figure that the best course of action was to enter a temporary truce whereby they could solidify themselves and secure their position for overthrow. Not stand dogmatically by their principles in light of changed circumstances. To do so would have only led to their downfall. Nine years later, the war was over, and that old contradiction had regained its primary position. All understandings of contradiction were absolutely necessary in solving this dilemma, and any movement that has succeeded in any way has, consciously or not, worked through this method. So, contradictions are internal and external, benign and antagonistic, primary and secondary, they are particular and they are universal, they are required to understand the world and for it to exist in the first place. I am going to bring the microphone into shot because why not, it's the end of the video and you can put up with a bit of 4 4 breaking, you'll prefer my voice anyways. <laughs> Now, when Richie got hit back in 2017, everybody was wondering, oh, you know, should we hit him? Should we not? When should we? Everyone's ideas were sort of all over the place in terms of what to do. So I feel having this sort of precise, formal methodology behind, you know, how you work out things is very, very important. And it streamlines the whole process. 
So if you haven't already, do go and check out On Contradiction. It's a real short read, to be honest. You can read it in less than an hour. And if you can't be bothered to read it, then please do go and check out Brett and Allison over at the Red Menace podcast. They're doing some really great work. They're already discussing this one. This is what this whole collaboration effort was about. Uh, so yeah, do go check them out. They are bringing theory down to the every person. So now that I have the chance and sort of on that topic, I would now like to talk about the application of this to LeftTube. When I started on YouTube four or five years ago, there were scant few left tubers with over a thousand subscribers. Now there are hundreds of us and many people like me with tens of thousands of subscribers. You know, I think these figures speak for themselves, but this comes with brand new challenges. Two years ago, Natalie Wynn said this. Look, what the left needs to get, and what the centrists need to get, and what only I and the fascists seem to understand, is that reason doesn't matter very oh much. Oh boy, here what we go. What the centrists hate about social justice warriors? It's not that they don't have good reasons in support of their arguments, it's that they're not cool, right? Now that was true of the left of 2017. Some elegance, some style, and indeed some reduction were all necessary in building those initial phases. But it's not so true of today. We are now part of a left, a left tube, that is becoming very popular as the older, more right-wing variants became antiquated and whose only real avenue now is extreme reaction. Yet we're still hanging on to this idea of ourselves as the left of old instead of the left of new. We still picture ourselves as this fine underdog fighting against the belly of the beast. And in the larger aspect, you know, that's still true. But online, that is waning. Remember that the old anti-feminist YouTubers got so affluent in their prize that they took a backseat. We cannot make the same mistake. Once you've got people onto your boat, it's necessary to guide them to shore. What, you gonna stay where you are? Huh? People are gonna get bored. They're going to leave your boat and they're gonna join someone else's boat. Take control of the narrative, God damn it. We don't need to talk about and fret about conservatives as much as we used to. We have that power. Now, if we don't evolve, if we don't start putting forward our new theory, and if we don't start putting forward our ideas into real life action, then all we seek to do is replicate the same circumstances that led to the rise, domination, and eventual fall and splitting of all other YouTube movements that came before us. Politics is serious. And I do not want to believe that the most that we can accomplish on this platform is mere edutainment. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. I am sure that if Lenin was alive today, Wait, Skillshare isn't sponsoring this video. No, I can say whatever I want. Fuck you, Skillshare. You're an inferior platform, you ain't so great. If anyone had a brain, they'd sell their subscriptions and get Linda instead. You know what, fuck you, Linda, you're not so great. I don't need to pay three times the price for imaginary certificates. No, go fuck yourself. Tell you what, let's bring out the real heroes in this discussion. Yeah, these guys. These are the patrons who sponsor me on Patreon. Thank you ever so much. They're the real heroes in this battle. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to nobody, because you're already fabulous. Thank you ever so much for watching. Go dwell on your contradictions. It has been made aware to me, as of late, that Maoism is authoritarian and is therefore bad. That is why I am bringing forward the next stage of Marxist evolutionary scientific development. Libertarian Maoism. Make sure that you subscribe to Libertarian Maoism.